go. Terry, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Awesome. Well, um, I suppose I, uh, I listened to you talk on that episode of Q and a, and, um, you know, to your point, we started talking and you're like, you know, why do you want to speak to me? Like, you know, it seems like your show is all about drugs and psychedelics and, you know, um, psychology and all that sort of stuff. But I thought it would be so good to speak to you because I felt like across that, uh, that board of people, that was, it was a really good episode, but I felt like, you know, you, you had your own opinions and things like that, but the one opinion you had the most that really shone through to me was just how important it is just to hear all sides. And, um, I reckon that's a really tough thing. I can, um, it's one of the reasons I want to, want to get you on the show. I think it would be a tough thing to manage egos, especially in the world of politics. So there's kind of like a psychological, you know, foundation to this episode, but, um, I don't know, was that to, to, to lead things off here? Is that like a skill you've had to develop? I think for anyone who works in an occupation with people uh, and where you're we're trying to bring people together, and so you would know this more than I would, you must be constantly challenged by different perspectives and different views and different life experiences as well that bring people to different understandings of what's going on in the world. You must have that all the time in your job, I suspect. Yeah, I mean, you, you certainly do, but I suppose it's like a little bit different because when, when a client comes to you um, with a problem, I try to... I try to view myself as, as a mirror. So like the less, I mean, obviously when you're speaking with a human being, you can't help but be a little bit authentic and, you know, um, talk about, you know, things that have helped you in the past and little things like that. But more often than not, it's trying to help a client deal with um, whatever going, whatever is going on in their lives. And I just imagine that when you're talking about reform and legislation, the way you would like to see, you know, the world change in Australia change, I can imagine it would be this like, you know, well, I want it like this way. Well, I want it like this way. And it's like, sometimes we have to, this is what I thought you did a really good job of in that episode was like, we have to remember that we all want the same thing here. We're all, we're all trying to be happy and we all want to live meaningful lives here. We're getting caught in the little nitty gritties, but ultimately, you know, we all got the same thing. So it's a little bit different with counseling. Um, um, but uh, yeah, I suppose you're right. I suppose there's some similarities there. I mean, I guess in politics, one of the things that's really interesting is, uh, I mean, you know, as in as in any sort of occupation where there's conflict, and whether that's conflict between people or conflict of ideas or um, you know your own internal struggle, your own internal conflicts, um, everyone is everyone who's coming to get involved in politics is the product of all of their life experiences, choices, mm. the people they've been around, the things that they've learned, and so I think it's worth trying to think about well, what is it that has brought this person here today. So for example, um, people come to my office, uh, if they've got a problem, maybe it's a problem with the national disability insurance scheme or with the NBN or with immigration or with the tax office or with Centrelink. And I don't know what their problem is when they, when they first come to the office. And sometimes it presents as people just being furious and they hate politicians and they blame us and they want to just tell my office off, like tell Terry Butler, you know, rah, rah, rah. Uh, yeah. and Sometimes when you look behind that, that's coming from a place of uh, exhaustion, frustration, distress, mm. because those problems with, you know, with your disability insurance or your Centrelink or your immigration status, those are problems that can be basically putting you in a situation where you don't have certainty in your life. You're not sure what, mm. what's going to happen next. And, and so sometimes the, the, that turns into wanting to lash out at the person who you see is ultimately to blame, which is your federal member. So those situations, my staff who, you know, like working in a lectured office, it's, they don't have the skills in counselling. They don't have the skills in psychology. So what they can't do is they can't counsel people, but they can develop the sort of the skills of empathy, listening, working with people. And, of course, some people, some people are just awful, right? So some people just ring you up to have a go, not for any good reason. That's fine. That's part of the job. I'm bored. Uh, I'm bored. <laughs> I don't like the colour of her lipstick in yeah. Parliament today. Exactly. <laughs> but um, that's not most people. Most people are looking for some assistance. And so one of the skills that we all learn in politics is trying to get to the bottom of what is really driving someone, if it's an individual problem. And then on the more systemic problems, you know, the people who are, who are getting in touch with me because they want to talk about the environmental law not working for protecting wildlife 
or they're worried about the way that water is being allocated in the Murray-Darling Basin and whether that's going to affect their livelihood in agriculture. You know, people are talking about big issues. Um, they're coming from a place of um, something has, has ignited that spark of, of concern or anxiety or anger or um, more positive emotions, hope, and they want to they be part of change. And for me as a, as a politician, one of the really important parts of my job is reminding people that they actually do have the power to be part of change because the enemy of, of good reform isn't wrong. It's, it's not the wrong idea. It's, it's, it's actually people just disengaging altogether. That's the enemy mm. of good reform. People just going, well, I can't have any impact on this. I'm not even going to bother. That, that's the real problem because when there's yeah. good ideas, bad ideas, conflict, disagreement, you can synthesise from that. But when people just turn off altogether because they think it's useless, um, that, that's the real problem. And that's the problem that we're really starting to confront now, right, which is people saying, well, politics is useless. I don't even really believe in democracy anymore. Um, everyone in politics is an idiot. Why would I bother spending any time with them? They're all corrupt. They're all out for themselves. And this is this deep cynicism that's starting to develop right now about politics. Mm-hmm. Well, that's actually terrible because the minute people think that they don't have any capacity to participate, then they stop participating and then the space gets filled that space, if you drop out of politics, that space gets filled by someone who may not have your best interests at heart, who may not have the community's best interests at heart. So the, the really strange thing about politics itself is that the more people who participate in it, the better it is. Mm. But it, it is hard to participate in and it becomes very tempting to think, oh, I'll just gonna, I'm just going to leave this to other people. But if, if you do that, the less you actually are willing to engage and hear views that are totally different to yours and understand other people's perspectives and put yourself in people's shoes, the less you're willing to do that, the more you just leave, you vacate the field and you leave it up to people who are, you know, willing to do it and may not mm. be doing that from the best place. Yeah, yeah, they have their own agenda and they just want to, they'll just say all the right things and you can, you can, you know, picture Hitler in the 1930s just giving them what they want and revving them up and, um, you know, I think, yeah, and, you know, we were discussing before the show started um, that idea just to bring all opinions, get the full spectrum, you know. Have you seen that documentary on Netflix, The Social Dilemma? No, I haven't seen it, but I gather it's quite good. I'm, I'm keen to have watch it. Have you heard it. about it? Yeah, I have. I have heard yeah. about it, actually. Yeah. It's, it's, it's this point exactly. It's using, yeah. um, you know, the US as, as, as a representative of what we're talking about here, but it just goes to show what happens when you're constantly fed, you know, um, and you're staying in these echo chambers and for years sometimes. Yeah. And you can, you can see yeah. how partisan these situations get. And I think... Um, you know, that idea of coming back in and just reminding ourselves what the big picture is here. And then, and then hearing these different, different perspectives is um, like, to your point, it's so important, but it's equally very difficult because, you know, it's that little, that trigger when someone says, well, I don't agree. It's like, what? I'm not a bad person. It's like, why well, didn't say that? Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And people have just got to stop taking everything personally. I think that's, that's part of the problem, right? Everyone kind of, at the, I'm listening. Not to overgeneralize. It's that's a silly overgeneralization. But I think um, we all feel it in ourselves, right? The the sense of, well, why is this person having got me? It's not my fault. When actually the person's not having got me, the person yeah. is expressing you. And so you have to recognize in yourself and then just push through it. And I think this that's why empathy is the key skill. Mm-hmm. What I was trying to say before about what skills do you need? You need the skill of empathy, which is to realize that even though I might completely disagree with someone and I might think their idea is nuts. Um, I I at least should be in a position to drop down the, the kind of the, the, um, drawbridges, not, not erect a a, a fortress around myself, but be open to listening. And, you know, professionally that's, that's part of our job. But if you are someone who is not professionally involved in politics, it doesn't mean you're not involved in politics because everyone, whether you like it or not, is involved in politics the decision to stay out of it is a political decision, right? So um, the more that we can um, try to put each other, put ourselves in each other's shoes, the better. And sometimes when you say this sort of thing, you get kind of accused of being an appeaser or a sellout or a centrist, you know. Um, 
And really what I'm saying is just uh, there's a difference between kind of where your political views sit on a political spectrum and your kind of demeanour and approach. And, you know, I, I try to be moderate, not in the sense of necessarily my political views, which are quite left wing, but in my approach to politics, my moderation is about um, I will listen to anyone. Um, you know, there's some people in the parliament that I do not want to work with uh, and who I think are just bonkers. Like, totally, totally. <laughs> happy to name them, but let's not, um, you know, and, uh, and, you know, you give them the benefit of the doubt and, and if, if they are actually just actively dangerous and terrible, then you're going to give them a swerve, right? Of, yeah, course. Yeah, of course. But, but most people... Uh, even though you might think that they're entirely wrong, you can still have a reasonable conversation with, listen to each other, uh, and that will also help you sharpen up your arguments. I mean, debate is so important, right, because you test your ideas and it's not sharpening them up to necessarily just be persuasive to other people. It's to satisfy yourself that Mm. it's not just all confirmation bias and being in your own bubble that's that's leading you to this conclusion. And so Mm. I think that's actually why parliament is so important. It is the place where we can come and test out ideas in a representative way, in a way where we all send someone down there, they all get in a room and they try to talk it out. And so when things like the gagging of debate or shutting down of parliament happen, I, I don't think that's very good for our democracy. I mean, self-evidently not good for our democracy, but it's not good for it in two ways. It's not good for it because the accountability is missing but also the absence of contest leads to a degraded quality of our political debate, of our political understanding and, and the public square discussions that, that, um, that, are, that we need to happen so that things actually do get threshed out, especially since, I mean, we're facing all these new challenges, don't we? Climate change, right. biodiversity crisis, COVID pandemic, biggest recession in almost a century. I mean, these, this, and the bushfires, I mean, put this yeah. year together. Yeah. That's it pretty good list of big crises we have to manage and we are going to be worse at doing that if we don't have good quality opportunities to really to really nut it out to really talk to people who disagree with you listen to different Mm -hmm. ideas be open to different ideas do you think is a question i was just kind of thinking as you were speaking then do you think that maybe sometimes people's frustration comes from you know a lack of maybe people see that this, this constant discussion of ideas, which, you know, I love philosophy, like let's just go for hours. Um, but people see that as like a, there's a, there's a lacking of urgency about the things that potentially need to be, you know, um, taken on with a greater sense of urgency. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I totally do. And yeah, like, I don't think anyone wants us to be sitting around having a Toastmasters debate, you know, like this yeah. isn't grade 12 mooting or, or debating team or whatever. Um, but take, Take the wage subsidy, right? So right now this is fundamental to whether people can afford to pay their rent, mm-hmm. have food on the table, but it's also fundamental to whether the consumption part of the economy is going to keep going, whether small businesses are going to go broke, um, So and, and more broadly what the future revenues of the government are going to be and therefore what public services can be paid for, all of these mm-hmm. things, right? So wage mm-hmm. wage subsidies are um, crucial and, and we if we withdraw support from the economy too quickly, then that will be a problem for a whole range of people for a whole, for quite a long time. So the urgency is there in the debate and it's through the debate that you identify problems and flaws. So for example, the recent changes that said, well, all right, for businesses that are now now going to move out of the wage subsidy cohort, they can then cut the wages of people who work for them by $300. Well, that wasn't something that was necessarily evident to people until that was picked up in the parliament, debated in the parliament. Mm. So it's not just about sort of nice ideas and, you know, neoliberalism versus democratic socialism and rehashing the same debates over and over and over again. It's actually about applied ideas, mm. not, not just abstract, but applied. And those applied ideas affect, affect what's going to happen in your house, what's going to happen in my house. Uh, they're going to affect how our kids, those of us who have kids uh, or our grandkids, um, how their lives are being led. They're going to affect um, the lives of people around the world as well because what we do, we know we're not, um, we're just not in a vacuum. We are part yeah. of an interconnected global system and so that's going to affect that as well. So when I'm talking about debate, I'm talking about what does it take to make sure that the 
potential consequences are ventilated, that ideas are brought up, you know, and whatever the issue might be, wage subsidy is just one example. The more you have that, the more publicly um, you can have the discussion, the more people can be informed and the more they can make a decision about their future. Because ultimately, for me, politics is all about putting the power in the hands of everyone, not in the hands of only a few people. So I do a lot of, um, a lot of my time I just spend telling people that actually you can make a difference, right? yep. which sounds really fundamental and trite, but if you, if you do engage, you can't, you can't, you don't just walk into a political um, uh, site and get your own way from day one because it's not how it works. You know, we're all yeah. trying to work to make a difference together. Some people get really frustrated. They say, oh, well, I don't like this one thing that this party did. So that's it for me. I'm out of here. Or <laughs> <Exactly>. um, <laughs> they didn't adopt my brilliant idea. So they must yeah. be idiots. I'm gone. That, that's I'm not the perfect one. Look at all these people driving the wrong way down the freeway. <laughs> What? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So some people, I think, do have unrealistic expectations. But if you think, if you think of yourself as, I am a person, I'm one person, right? My my position is that I have the capacity to have an influence, and yes, everyone else has that capacity too. And sometimes you win, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you're persuasive, sometimes you're not. Uh, But it actually doesn't make it. It does make a difference if if you get involved, and that's really. I spend a lot of my time in politics just trying to convince people that actually they shouldn't just give up and leave it to everyone else. They should step up, take both the responsibility, but also the opportunity of having a meaningful impact on what happens to the future of this country. Because a country is like an imaginary thing that we all create in our minds collectively, right? Like not, I don't mean the geography of a country, but the, the body politic, the idea, the institutions that we have are created by people, the identity that we have is created by people and by culture and culture is created by people. So every, every day, every person in this nation is creating this nation as it exists at the moment. And so to participate in politics is to have agency in the creation of whatever Australia is at the time. Mm, Yeah. So this is, this is really interesting to me because the, the bulk of my work and my writing is in existential therapy and depth psychology. So when you're starting to talk about, you know, not from a a geographical or or a physical perspective, creating the country, um, you're talking about the way we see people like 200 years ago, the way we saw women, you know, to, to, to today, you know, the way we see literally ourselves and how we can, it's, it's really, really deep. And it's just funny as you're talking, I'm like, there's a lot of psychology going on here. So I'm, I'm pumped that I got you on the show. Were you always into politics? How did you, you know, wh- where did you come from? How did you start to get interested in these kind of, you know, broader social issues? I mean, I, um, I am interested in politics and have been for my whole life because mm. uh, of the material dimensions of politics, the quality of life issues. You know, um, it actually matters to my family who's in government because it's the difference between us being able to finish school or not, us being able to get medical help or not. Um, so, you know, like, so, I mean, it's so, it's so, I'm such a classic Labor Party stereotype. My parents went to grade 10. I am, I am, it's true. My parents finished school at grade 10 and um, in the 1970s and I went to all the way through to grade 12 and then to university in the 1990s. And what was different, I'm not smarter than them, of course, I just had more opportunity. And the reason I had yeah. more opportunity is because of Gough Whitlam, Bob Paul, Paul Keating and all the people mm. in those governments and everyone who voted Labor. Um, and, you know, my, my dad uh, worked for Australia Post. Uh, he took a redundancy. He was one of the so many people who took a redundancy in the early 90s from Australia Post. And, you know, if it wasn't for union movement, um, fighting for conditions, paying conditions in Australia Post, his life would have been very different. Um, you know, and even now, like my, my mum's a teacher's aide, my dad's now working as a hospital wardsman, my sister is a teacher. Mm. All of those jobs and all of the people who benefit from those jobs, public school kids and public hospital patients, their lives are directly affected by who's in executive government by who the prime minister is by who the ministers are and which party is running the show and so i'm a very um 
I take politics so seriously because it actually so seriously affects my life and the lives of people around me. And that's yeah. all, that's, that's, that's why I'm in it. Uh, but that's not necessarily the case for everyone. And some people are in it for more abstract reasons. Like they've had comfortable lives. They've had a lot of opportunity. It's been multi-generational for their families, but they do politics because they care about more abstract things like trust, like morality, like the environment, not that the environment's abstract, but less material, you know. So um, they say, they see it as it doesn't necessarily affect their lives directly, but they have a great um, moral and spiritual, in some cases, connection to making sure that they may never visit the Great Barrier Reef themselves, but they care about it so deeply because it actually is um, such an important natural wonder and an important part of the world's sort of natural environment and natural heritage. So there's plenty of good reasons to be in politics that aren't material um, to, you know, as in your own life and the lives of your family and friends, but just are just as important and just as significant. So whether you're in politics because you want to make sure that people like you can get medical assistance, that's good quality medical assistance, or whether you're in politics because you want to make sure that people, nothing like you, who you've never met and are never going to meet, get the benefit of natural beauty and um, and important uh, parts of our national identity and our heritage, both great reasons to be in politics. And there's plenty of others as well, of course. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, I think, you know, I was never interested in politics and then I started to look into psychology and, and seeing the amount of people that were um, addicted to drugs. And then I was also interested because I've grown up in a time where people are starting to question, you know, we're not just going droll drugs are bad. It was like, well, some are really good, you know, and then that was always interesting to me. And then I started moving into understanding more about the war on drugs. And I was like, oh my God, I'm actually, I'm developing a social conscience here. What the hell's going on? <laughs> me, like arrogant, self-centered me, like what? <laughs> I'm sure you're um, not arrogant and self-centered. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I think I have a natural proclivity to think for my, my partner will tell you that anyway. Um, but uh, no, it was just, it was just really interesting, but um, you know, I think you're very similar to my dad. I think my dad's always been interested in social issues and, you know, did you, were your parents into politics? What were they? Oh, not, not really. I mean, no. uh, that my dad was in the union, uh, but everyone was in the union, you know, he was a union delegate. It was what you did. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't think, you know, they, they were never Labor Party members. They never were involved in politics. They never kind of went to meetings or anything like that. Um, it's more, it was more just the kind of, just the, the unspoken understanding of what the difference between Liberal governments and Labor governments was, right? And none of my family were really yeah. in politics at all. I, I was just, you know, I kind of, uh, I guess I fell in with the wrong crowd and we ended up in politics. Um, wow. That's what happened. But but I don't, know, I don't know how old your dad is, uh, but he's, he's probably he'll somewhere. He'll be listening to this. <laughs> I, th- I'm, I swear he's 60. <laughs> dad, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know he's My I know dad he's is 60. 63. So okay. my father's 63. So they're about the same same generation. Uh, I was going to say your dad's probably closer to my age, but um, no. But <laughs> uh, the, um, the, I guess that generation, they just knew, I, they just had a good sense of, what was right and what was wrong and what they need to do to make things better. And, and that's important, right? Like it's important to know what you want to do and, and, but also to feel like they not, they never really would have questioned whether they had the right to insist on things getting better because that was just something they had the right to do. And we should all have that too. You know, like everybody should feel like not be defeated, not think, Oh, well, everything's, you know, there's nothing we can do. Everything's terrible. We might as well just, you know, we can't give in to kind of despair or nihilism. We have to mm. actually commit to change and that's important. But I guess from your perspective, if you were, if you, what started getting your a social conscience was mm-hmm. thinking about how criminalisation, war on drugs are affecting the community, then you will have in looking at that seen really clearly how political decisions, decisions made by elected representatives can affect that, but also how public sentiment can affect what decisions are made by politicians as well. So there's a sort of a, people sometimes blame politicians, but politicians are often reflecting the sentiment of the public. And so the question isn't just what you, what do you get 151 members of the House of Representatives to think? It's often what, how do you change the views and perspectives of, you know, 25 million people or 23 million people? Um, 
mm. or, you know, 15 million adults, I guess, how do you actually start to change the entire community sentiment? And that's when you realise that politics is actually much more about understanding belief, perspective, values, evidence and prejudice in some ways mm. than it is about, you know, whether individual politicians are good or bad people. You know, it's, it's not simplistic. It's actually much more nuanced than that. Yeah. So did you exactly. find... Yeah, is that and that is that what you've think thought about when you've thought about the war on drugs? Like, have you thought about community community sentiment and how that is evolving and whether the politicians are keeping up? I don't know too much about the the specific um, politics in Australia when it comes to the war on drugs. Um, obviously, I'm very much pro um, decriminalisation. Um, you know, I've, I've had my own experiences in the past um, and just looking what's going on with, with the transformation these people having from a traumatic, from a trauma perspective with, with um, psychoactive chemicals in the U S and all these sorts of things. But, you know, you look at the discrepancy between what happened, what's happening in Portugal as opposed to what's happening in the Philippines, for example, and, and just, just, you know, just seeing, I don't think I'm saying anything too um, crazy or, or, or woo woo or whatever, but like seeing, addicts not as people that are criminals but are people that have mental health issues you know and i had my own mental health issues for six seven years um and um that's why i became a counselor because i was like well you know if i'm going through it <laughs> but it's it's i don't know too much about what's going on with it politically i'm only kind of just starting to get into that that area um but uh i just think that it kind of happens naturally and you, you said something before which i i really like how and I'm paraphrasing, but politicians are essentially just trying to, you know, hear what the people are saying and then reflect that back. Like, okay, well, that's a really interesting point. How can we move that into, into reform and all that sort of stuff? I found that the, the best quote when I was studying, you know, how to find a sense of meaning in life. And you mentioned the word capital N nihilism, you know, which is big, especially around people my age right now, trying to find an identity mm. and a meaning. Um, Gandhi said that the best way to find yourself is to give yourself to the service of others. You know, so in that light, politicians, the responsibility is insane. You're always going to get someone that doesn't like you or has a go at you for your red lipstick or whatever. But the meaning that you get as a result of that is enough to, I suppose, um, get you through the inevitable ups and downs of life. Look, I, you know, the thing, anyone who's lived a public life in whatever capacity, I think will tell you that sometimes you can feel actually really ambivalent about it. Like you, sometimes you can feel as though, I mean, there's so many amazing benefits and wonderful aspects of public life. And there's also so many um, downsides that some of which are not readily apparent unless you've actually lived it. Uh, and so sometimes I think it's just natural to feel quite ambivalent about, you know, um, is this, am I making enough of a difference to justify what goes with it? Mm -hmm. uh, and a friend of mine actually, um, she was the member for Perth. And so the Western Australian politicians have it worse than anyone else because they've got a flight of the Eastern Seaboard. Um, it's almost not worth going back in the weekend between sitting weeks because, you know, it's a five hour flight. And so you, they have big chunks of time away from family and friends and home. And so um, she just said, well, I, I just think I can, for the amount of sacrifice I'm making, I'm not making enough of an impact in this, in this, um, she said this publicly, I'm not breaching any confidences. I would make more of an impact from the state parliament. And then she ended up becoming a minister in their state government and is an excellent minister and they're lucky to have her and we were lucky to have her at the time to do. And so I think there's always for anyone in public life, this kind of constant question of, am I, is what I'm doing actually helping people enough to justify me doing it? Right. And I think it's healthy to ask those questions uh, because the minute the answer is no, well then that's, that's timed. That's you call time. Then you let someone else do it. Right. Um, but, uh, that's a very different, I think, proposition to this question of how do you avoid the feeling like everything is meaningless? And yeah. one of the things that we don't tend to have in politics is people thinking everything is meaningless because if people are in politics, it's because meaning is driving them. Totally. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, to the point about Gandhi, I mean, I guess um, a side benefit, not the reason to do politics, but a bonus from doing politics is that you do, you do see so much meaning, like the things you do 
do actually make a difference, um, regardless of whether you are a volunteer on a political campaign or, um, you know, a member of parliament or even, a, I assume, a prime minister, you actually do see the meaning in what you're doing. And so that can help, I think, you to uh, avoid any tendency um, towards nihilism that, that you might otherwise have. Um, but I think what's important for everyone right now is, you know, things, it is entirely possible to see, and you would see this from your, your clients, I'm sure, why people might start thinking that maybe nothing we do matters right now because yeah. of all the different shocks. Uh, and so an important, I mean, I'm not a psychologist. You, um, I don't have any counselling qualifications. I'm the least person in this, I'm the least qualified person in this conversation to, um, to have a feeling about having a, have a view about this. But I think that one of the important things to do, if you are tending to feel that way with all the shocks, is maybe think through the, the opportunities for the creation of meaning. And for me in my portfolio of environment and water, um, that was emphasized pretty heavily during the bushfires where yeah. you can see the difference that are ma- that's made when there's proper support for environmental protection organizations versus when there's not, you know, wildlife hospitals, that sort of thing. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, if, if people are thinking, oh, maybe there's, maybe this is all just too much and there's no point doing anything, it's not, an, and there is, there is a point doing things because you can make a difference. You can make a material difference to people's lives and also to animals' lives. And that's, that's worth a lot. I think, you know, there, totally. now is the time to be doing to, I, I don't, I mean, this is the most meaning there has been for a long time because there is so much stacked against us. That is a very, or we could, we could, I think we'll have to take that little bit out and put it on a couple of graphics on Instagram. It's so true. It's so true. Like, you know, I'm not just saying that, like when, when you do have the challenges stacked against you, that's when you have to lift the biggest rock and carry the biggest burden and go for it. And every little inch you creep forward is a, is a massive, massive win. That's why people get the runners high, you know, when they're running and they, you know, they beat their records or when they're in the gym, it's, I think people forget sometimes, including myself, you know, that, you know, it's like, this is how I get meaning over here. And this is how I get meaning over here. But it's like the human organism fundamentally works the same. We have a reward pathway called the dopaminergic system. The closer you get to your goal, whether it's writing a book or um, getting through a podcast without screwing up your, your sentences or whatever, you know, four years ago when I started, that was a massive win for me. Um, all of these little things get you that feeling of, Oh, I've really achieved something today, you know? Um, and, and if we can just, progressively do that, you know, not so much, um, you know, I think, I think people sometimes go, okay, well, you know, Tara Butler's this high in politics. She's been on Q and A and all these things like, you know, I'm only just studying. I've, I've read my first book on politics. How am I ever going to get there? You know, but it's little steps day and day and day and they stack up massively over 10 years. Oh, it's incredible. Um, actually being part of political campaigns, you know, mm. when you, when so I've been, I've been doing political campaigns a long, 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 I mean, I joined the Labor Party when I was 21, so I'm 42 oh, wow. now. <laughs> so half my life I've been in the Labor Party. Um, it's remarkable to say. <laughs> yeah. All my adult life. Awesome. Oh, my God. It's, a, it's actually, but throughout that time, I mean, you work on, you work on campaigns because you want to see change and it's important not to be unrealistic about it because things are very, it's difficult. You know, public life is difficult. Making change is difficult. You don't just get to say, as I say, walk in before, as I said before, walk in and get your own way immediately. Right. But whenever there is progress, if you've had a hand in that progress, it's satisfying. I mean, it's, that's not the only reason to do it. You don't do it just for your personal satisfaction, but, it still is pretty satisfying. You know, um, I did, I think I've worked on almost every election campaign, state, local and federal in that whole time, other than when, um, other than when I was having babies and, uh, mm-hmm. you do, you I mean, you do. I, I worked on Kevin Rudd's, um, the year that Kevin Rudd became the prime minister. I worked on that campaign and, and then to see him actually be able to get elected and then, you know, people remember where they are, where, where they were when when important things happen. I remember the national apology to the stolen generation. Yeah, yeah. And and to you know, John Howard had been so 
it's hard to remember now, but for people now, but he had been so resistant to and obstructive to the idea of an apology for such a long period of time mm. uh, that it almost seemed as though it would never happen. And then it did happen. And yes, it hasn't f- fixed everything. It's not, it's we're step. not living in a post oppression world. There's still the consequences of, of not just the stolen generations, but everything that's happened. Mm. Uh, but it, you know, it is. It's something that was important to to at least some of the people who were directly affected, and mm. I think it was important to our country. I, I think it was, and the same with marriage equality. You know, to um, to have been part of electing people who were just going to stand up and demand it until it got done. I mean, that's just it's it's great. It took a long time. Uh, it took a lot longer than I wish it had, but. It was never inevitable. It was always going to take agency by people, people actually be, being willing to turn up and vote for people who would do it, um, hand out flyers for them, knock on other people's doors for them, get them elected, then support them to move the, the legislation that would be needed and, and mm. to do the work to get people over. You know, so much was done and by so by just thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people and then you get to that one point where it's actually done it, you know it's it takes a lot to get change and I wish it didn't take so much to get change but the reason it does is because you're trying to aggregate the views of millions of people yeah. and that's a lot bigger of an issue than people think it is and that's fine yeah yeah, yeah ab- absolutely <laughs> I mean you look back on those kinds of things now you know marriage equality and and an apology and you're like what, like, why did that take so long? Like, that was a big, exactly. like, I, was, I was having yeah. a conversation with um, my partner this morning. We were just walking the dogs and um, she, she had like the, she had, she had, she has Archie who's on, who's got a much better harness than Abby does. Um, and I was like, Oh, you know, in the whole black lives matter thing, listen to this pop, listen to this comedian talk about it. And he's like, you know, there's black people in the U S like, they're not asking for much. eh? like, they just want to matter. <laughs> and like, that's such a good point. It's like, Black lives matter. It's like, oh yeah, okay. Well, okay. No, it's like all lives matter. It's like, well, yeah, but you're missing the point. I just thought that was yeah. so funny. It's like matter is like they're really not asking for a whole lot there, you know. But the very low threshold. Um, just make exactly make our lives matter as much as everyone else's. Yeah, it's very totally. It's not a very modest ask when you think about it. And to um, you know, and it's so, it's so interesting, right? Because people who a criticism of people who don't get involved in politics is that they don't because they just don't need to, you know, like if you're someone who isn't sure whether their 14 year old son can leave the house safely in the U S well then you don't really have any choice, but to have an opinion on politics. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so it's, that's what, when people talk about the privilege of not, not caring about politics is the privilege of not having to, because your life's going pretty well and you're pretty safe. Mm. Um, I think that's pretty striking. It's true. It, it's 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 self centered as well because you're not thinking about the people there for that who would absolutely need to see some kind of change as well. And I think it's probably one of the benefits about having the vote as compulsory here in Australia because it's like, you know, no matter who you are, you have to voice your opinion. You know, I don't even care if it sucks. It's like we just need the opinion. <laughs> it, it's true, and it's why I think we've done so. I mean, really, honestly. Totally. If without compulsory voting, we wouldn't be in the position that we're in now in relation to COVID, in relation to the, you know, the wage subsidy, in relation to the unemployment benefits, in relation, you know, all the things that do get done. Um, you just have to look around the world where their voting systems have allowed for populism to take hold and see how they're doing compared to us. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty clear, isn't it? I know. That's why I always defend it. I'll always defend compulsory voting. Even though people say it's not fair, why should I have to do it? Well, it's a pretty, again, it's a pretty low threshold. You have to do one thing. Yeah. uh, You get a cheap sausage. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. I know. So, so why do people say, what's, what's the counter argument to that? Uh, The counter argument is that uh, in a democracy, there should be a choice not to vote for anyone. Oh, that it's anti-democratic to require you to vote. I, I think that's a bit of a, just a frankly, a, a vacuous argument. Well, yeah, yeah. I guess two things. One is 
you are, you're not actually forced to vote for someone else. You can run yourself. Like if there is no one on that ballot paper that you think is any good, if you think you could do a better job than any of them, then nothing is stopping you from putting up your own hand. And sometimes people will say, well, why should I, I, you know, I've got a life, I've got things going on. And well, I mean, so did I, <laughs> it's like I had a life and I still did it. Um, there's, I think there's going to be a point where if you, where, where you say to yourself, well, if I'm not willing to do this myself, then I might think everyone in this ballot paper is a bit of an idiot. Um, but unless I'm willing to, to front up, then part of my civic obligation, part of my responsibility as a member of a society, not just someone who lives on an island somewhere, <clears throat> is I've got to mark a one next to one of these boxes and work out which one of those boxes it is. And I just, I really do think it's quite a small impost on people. Yeah. And the, uh, the benefits of it vastly outweigh the, the fact that you have, that you've got an obligation to do this, you know, I think it's actually really, it's really interesting psychology of this question. Of, it is, it's a parag- paradox to say that it's my democratic right not to exercise my democratic yeah. right. Well, I, I don't think it is. I think you're, um, we have a democracy, which means people determine what happens and your role in that is at a minimum to cast a ballot. I mean, I wish everyone would do more. I wish people would, pay attention to the issues. I wish they would write letters to their members of parliament. I wish they would ring their members of parliament up and have a chat to the, to the office about what's going on. I wish they would, you know, encourage their friends and family to pay attention to politics. There's so much mm-hmm. you can do in politics. Um, you know, and I don't, I don't mean like be really boring at parties and bang on about, about politics all night, but there are things you can do to have an impact on, on what happens and, and, if you do them, then that will, that'll change things, right? It's kind yeah. of a, a big ask. Yeah, well, it's not. It's, it's uh, yeah, I've got a friend of mine that's interested in politics and, um, you know, when I was kind of going through my, you know, couple of years cycle there of trying to figure out who I was and how I got in this body and how to get a girlfriend and, you know, all these sorts of things, um, it was like, you know, I, I think it's good to, um, as I said before, have a social conscience and, like, want to think about how Australia is, I think at the time I was just so lost in my own head. Um, but then see, having said that, it's kind of like, well, if someone was running who really, really valued mental health, they'd be like, oh, shit, maybe I could, you know, steer toward, towards this guy or girl. Um, you said something before. We were talking about uh, nihilism and finding meaning, specifically in politics and, and all this sort of stuff. Um, having a concern and the responsibility of representing people is obviously going to give your your life meaning. But you said something then as well, and you were talking about the member for Perth and how um, sometimes you feel like you're not doing enough. How do you balance that kind of not feeling like I'm doing enough with, well, I'm also just having my own life here and I want to spend time with my family and stuff. So I think for her it was she felt like she was doing so much, but the impact that she could make was a bigger impact if it was in the state parliament because the tra- kind of the transaction costs weren't as high. Like you didn't have to spend 10 hours on a plane there and back in order to make the contribution. You could make the contribution, a, oh, yeah. a bigger contribution in the state parliament by being part of, the, of that government. So that the trade-off is not am I working hard enough? It is, is the work I'm doing creating enough of an impact, Right. which is two slightly different things. Like, you know, that thing where you can just be super busy all the time but not very productive. Totally versus, you know, being, being really productive. And so the question is really what's your impact and, you know, what's your output? How many, how are you helping people? How are you making the place a better place? Right. Mm -hmm. And so the question about, well, how do you do that while still having a life is such a, it's such a big question. So difficult. You got time. (laughs) No, it's nuts though. Right. Because everyone says to me, I was doing this, um, I was chatting to a, political scientist yesterday who's doing some research about what politicians do. And um, he said, oh, so it's not, a, it's not a nine to five job then. And I just burst out laughing. The poor guy, he must've thought I was really, but it was so funny. Like this idea yeah, yeah. that you took a person, you know, <laughs> this guy. <laughs> I mean, oh no, but he was, I mean, he was so um, earnest and really trying to drill down. What do you do? What do you spend time on? And I felt so, I felt so bad about laughing at the proposition, but it is so funny. <laughs> Um, and, uh, it's like, there's just a lot of work in it, but people, um, one of the interesting things about it is that for, 
a long time, for decades, there's been a movement to make politics more possible for people with caring responsibilities. Mm. So, you know, um, and even since I've been there for more than six and a half years now, and even in that time, there's been some moves to make the sitting hours a bit more civilised, more sort of family friendly. I mean, we're still away from our families, but if you finish at 8 instead of 9.30, then that's time to get home, have some dinner, have some chats to the kids, you know, talk to them about whatever's going on um, in their day, that sort of thing. Uh, but but it's still really difficult. Like, don't get me wrong, it's still really difficult. So I'm away. Um, usually there's 20 sitting weeks or so a year and I'm away four nights of, of each of those weeks. And then in non-sitting weeks you'll travel for portfolio or committee work. And so there's, there's almost never going to be a week where you don't travel at least once. And so every week you're away somewhere, probably that's not necessarily true for everyone, but for a lot of people that's the case. And so um, every week you're away maybe once, maybe not quite, but that's the level of, of travel in it. And, uh, yeah. and so you are away. You're away from the kids, you're away from the family, you're away from the home. So it is, it's difficult. Um, a lot of people balance it by like doing what I do, which is I'm, you can't tell, but um our, our house is a compound. Like there's a flat in the backyard where my parents live. They work. I work. My husband works. The kids are here. Somewhere between the four of us is usually someone home for the yeah. kids to be here. Yeah. And then we pay someone to come into the house and help out as well. And and that makes it possible. It doesn't make it easy, but it makes it possible. Right. And I don't know what other people do, but a lot of people do similar configurations to that. Um, mm-hmm. And so the trick is, I think, to then say, all right, well, I've got to manage, got to think about how to make sure there's, you know, bread in the house and is there milk and has somebody thought about doing the washing for the kids' school uniforms and you know, all that sort of stuff, mental load stuff. And then it's um, what can I do with my, with my time that will make the most impact as a member of parliament? And so part of that is about how do I spend as much time in my local community as I can knowing that I've got to travel and then how do I use that downtime during travel, so while you're on the plane or at the airport, to do any reading or skilling up or that sort of thing? And then how do you then fit everything together? But the real trick is, and it's like this with any busy job, is realising that constant activity does not equal productivity. Yeah, for sure. Right? So it's actually about thinking about, well, if I never stop to think about what's important, how can I possibly do a good job? Because one of the things we talked about, holding a mirror up to the community as a, as a representative before you have to reflect back what people want at the same time, you owe them your judgment and you owe them leadership as well. Like, it, yeah. you know, it's not just, you know, you don't just poll the electorate every five minutes and then, um, and then, you know, just vote in a, in a way that reflects that what you actually have to be doing is thinking about what the community needs, thinking about what the nation needs, exercising judgment um, and, 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 and where it's necessary, shaping public opinion by being a, a leader, by speaking up, you know, which, you know, we talked about marriage equality before. That was an example of that for a long time. So, so being like a leader in terms of um, not completely disregarding what you want and what you want to see as well. Well, I think that's right because you're elected on platform, right? So, like people that, um, so the political philosopher Edmund Burke, who is a conservative, not someone that, um, you know, that you'd necessarily expect a Labour Party person to be quoting, but his kind of view of it was um, that it's a it's a duty as a as a member of a parliament to exercise your own judgment and your own thoughts. Yeah. And, and part of that is because you know one of the things that is part of our job and in, uh, an inherent part of the job is getting across all the detail. You know, like if I said to you, how would you like me to vote on the? There was a bill recently in relation to prohibiting. Um, items in detention centres, so immigration detention centres uh, that would have allowed, that will if passed, allowed someone like Peter Dutton to make an order that says no more mobile phones in immigration detention, mm-hmm. right? Now, if, if you only heard some of the speeches in relation to that bill, then your position would be you need to vote against it. If you only heard some of the other speeches, your position would be, well, you clearly need to vote for it, right? Yeah. Um, so someone like me, part of the job is getting across all of those arguments and getting a deeper understanding and not just taking a kind of, it's not a superficial understanding, but it's an understanding that's because you don't have, you don't have all the time I have to actually yeah. get to the detail of this. 
Like if you've got a job, you're a counsellor, you've got clients, you're super busy, maybe you've got to take the dogs for a walk, maybe you've got elderly parents, not that your parents are elderly, but maybe you've got elderly relatives that you care for. Um, you know, all that stuff happens. You don't necessarily have time to dig deep into the detail of that legislation, but you want people in my role and our staff to be digging into it and then exercising our judgment based on what we know about it mm-hmm. rather than just trying to take a, a really knee-jerk reaction to something that you only have 10% of the information about. So yeah, exactly. um, that's where judgment comes in and leadership comes in is actually taking the time to get to the bottom of things and then say, well, this is what I'm going to do. And then if, um, if it's something that the majority of people don't agree with, and if, it, if that's enough of a disagreement to think, well, that's terrible representation, well, then vote against me at the, at the next um, election, right? That's how that kind of goes. Yeah. But I think that's one of the reasons why I can imagine you'd be so, you know, well, as popular as you are anyway, because you're open to that uh, side of things. It's like, if you don't agree with me, that's fine. You know, I, I, that's why, again, why I want to get you on the show, because I, I felt like that was your energy throughout the whole show it was just to encourage talking encourage debate that whole time you know and i can think of a perfect example of in my world why um you know as as opposed as to the dangers of um having an ideological viewpoint and i can have someone come to me who's got who's a a real victim to something they're telling me about you know my boyfriend did this or my girlfriend did this and all that's happening and then slowly over a certain amount of time and sessions as opposed to me just being like you need to break up with them and tell me more about them and let's get up and about, you know, it's like, well, hang on, how are you actually mediating the discussions? And, you know, are you putting yourself in scenarios that, you know, like what's going on here? Um, Because I think part of um, being a counselor and a therapist, as well as I suppose part of being a a politician, to your point before, part of being a leader in that way um, is not necessarily to make people like you, but it's, to make people um, transcend themselves in a way. And also face up to things that they don't want to face up to, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, which is which is uh, the tough part. You know, I know that within my own world, I'm like, I'm always right. What are you talking about? I, I get it wrong with when I'm driving and uh, I feel like I know the directions and I don't need Google Maps, you know, at all. But for whatever reason, unless that Google Maps is on, I, we don't get there. So, you know, even though I still believe, I think I get the maps right, but no, it's a, it's a good point. <laughs> but with your clients, uh, you, you, you're not there as an empty vessel. You're there as a person with your own experiences um, as well. And I guess they don't, they're, they're not there for artificial intelligence or a computer to tell them how to, how to resolve issues. They're there because you're a flesh and blood person who has judgment and emotional intelligence and also experience and skill and training. And so I guess you would feel that, um, I mean, you're not going to be unprofessional and, and um, put your own, jud- your own sort of prejudices and prejudging forward. But at some point there has to be, doesn't there, a point where you say, well, this is my view, this is why I think. Mm-hmm. What do you think? It's actually got to be, there's got to be some of you as a person uh, injected into anything that you're doing through counselling, I, I imagine. I mean, yeah. tell me if I'm wrong. No, no, you're, you're exactly right. And this is the, this is, this is really interesting. Um, you know, we, we can look at like the Freudian model and, and trying to literally not even be in the room and just try to get what's, what's coming up um, and reflect it back onto them. So there's no one in there. And, you know, that's a really good point because Freud was worried about what was called transference, just this idea that people might start to project external uh, issues onto their therapist, things can come out and things do come out when the boundaries are crossed, so to speak. Um, and not even just boundaries when it's like, you know, you're starting to put too much of your own views and you're, um, I suppose, um, inhibiting their ability to become their own individual selves. So that's a really important point. But then at the same time, it's kind of like, unless I'm speaking to someone who is a human and does know what it means to be a human, um, I'm not going to get anywhere either because we've evolved socially, you know, and, mm. and we need that as well. And I think that's what's part of building rapport. And, you know, I've interviewed heaps of psychologists and some of them are very for that authentic rapport building. Um, and we live in a world now where it's like, be your authentic self, you know, come on. Hey, I, this happened to me too. Um, and then you just, and then you become friends with your clients. So that's kind of weird, you know? Um, and on the other side of that, it's kind of like, well, you know, should I say anything 
it's it's I think it's it, it's a case by case basis almost. I read. Um, do you, do you know um, Irvin Yalom from San Francisco? The um, his psychotherapist writes really good books about um, mm. philosophy and psychology and uh, and also kind of fear of death and the um, mm. the uh, the way that fear of death can manifest um, and. He writes really incredible stories and what I find really remarkable about, because he talks about, he doesn't obviously reach any confidence, but he talks about therapy. What I find really interesting about those stories is the way that he's always checking about how his client feels about the thing that is happening right then, which is the therapy session. Like, how do you feel? Mm. How do you, how are you feeling about what I've said? How are you feeling about what you've said? And, um, you know, how do you feel our relationship is going, which is, I think a really interesting thing because it requires the counselor to be so honest about um, what they're doing. You know, you're almost yeah. um, removing the veil of, of um, the therapy conversation and reminding people that it's a conversation between two people. And I think that that would be an interesting, I'm fascinated by the idea of being a counselor, but that would be an interesting part of, of being a counselor is not it is working out where the boundaries are working out, how to be a present, authentic human without becoming, without breaking down that professional distance. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. I think, I think you know, emotions are things that people don't really give enough attention to. Uh, and we're, we're, st- we're hearing about it in, in the world, but it, it's, it's more specific than that. I think, um, you know, you can imagine growing up, uh, um, uh, as, as, as I'm sure you have, <laughs> you don't need to imagine it. Um, I, I did grow up, yes. Yeah, exactly. One time, one time you did, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you can imagine yourself like going to your first day of school or something and you're like, Mum, you know, I'm, I'm actually I'm really nervous or so I've got a public speech coming up. And they're trying to help you, but they might say something, oh, don't be nervous. And, and that over time you start not to trust the way you feel. So then what happens as a result, you get to your, you, you know, your adult life and we live in this you know, consumer world where it's like, do, 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 do. And you might get a a feeling of fatigue or anxiety perhaps, but it's like, I've got to get this done. So have another coffee. Then over time, you can imagine why people get panic attacks or people have um, existential breakdowns because it's decades of not listening to the way they're feeling. This is something I said Mm. to people all the time, um, especially with men, because men are, I don't think that men, at least in my experience, necessarily struggle with, you know, talking about their emotions but it's more or less just they like to get in the gym or or do something and i'm obviously generalizing you know um but uh you do that over time one of the first things we want to start to do is to your point um just how are you feeling right now you know it's not like oh woe is me i need to just think about how i'm feeling all the time but it's it's the awareness of listening to how you're feeling and then integrating that to kind of flush it out, if you get me. So it's like, if I'm feeling really angry, mm-hmm. I'd much prefer to uh, punch my boxing bag or go for a run than, than hit someone. But if you don't listen to your emotions, that's that's going to lead to... to, to that's something. my mum in the background, everyone. Oh, Hi. g'day, mum. <laughs> we were talking about you Just before, actually. We were, we were talking about This is Tom. Hi, Tom. And his audience, because we're going to be a podcast. That's right. That's right. <laughs> name is she's got flowers. There she is. Oh, very nice. How good, geez, they're pretty good, aren't they? Aren't they? It's from got a local florist. Yeah, on top of it. <laughs> small, <laughs> okay. Supporting small business, guys. Supporting small business. This is No, well, actually, that's why we did it, because um, during COVID, there's a there's a local florist and they really started to struggle because yeah. you know no one was going out to shops and uh, a friend of mine mentioned that they were just getting um, a, just a regular weekly flowers and I said well surely I can manage to kick in for that as well so here we are mm. yeah that's good it, it is good it's so funny I've I've got a friend down the road who works at a florist and for whatever reason he's pumped with work at the moment I think everyone in Melbourne down here is just sending everyone flowers like how are you feeling. <laughs> Yeah, it makes so it makes so much sense, right? Yeah. It really does. Yeah, for sure. Hey, Terry, have you ever found yourself in a position where you actually don't agree with necessarily what the party's pushing for? Yeah, it's a really it's a question I get a bit actually, and it's an important one because it's about how our collectivism in politics works, right? So, um, we the Labor Party built on the union movement, built on the idea that people are stronger together, built on the idea that when we're united, we get more done. So I guess the, the kind of fundamental basis for the Labor Party is you have a situation where there's a whole bunch of people with a lot of money and a lot of power. And then on the other side, 
there's a whole bunch of people with not much money and not much power, but what they do have is the ability to combine together and then they have power and then mm. they can have a chance at least of, of um, getting somewhere against people whose interests don't necessarily align with them. So for a long, long time, our position has been we're stronger together, we combine, we work together, and that's how we, we win. So the way that that plays out in our politics as the Labor Party is you have what's called a caucus. So a caucus is just a group of people who come together, make decisions together, and then they all decide, they all agree that they will support whatever the outcome of that process is. So in a caucus, um, you, you have the opportunity to debate, speak, fight, argue, all of that, and you can have some really good, strong um, arguments and disagreements, but then once that's finalised, once you've reached a position, then you all go out and you accept that and you adopt it and you fight for it together. And the reason it works that way is because that's, that's served us so well in getting things done. Mm. So in, in, is the, in answer to your question, I guess I've never been in a caucus where I have felt like I didn't have the right to speak up, express my views and argue for a position. I've always, when I've disagreed with what other people have been saying that we should do in a caucus situation, is I've always gone in and said, here's what I think we should do, here's what's important, here's, and, and argued the case. And, mm-hmm. um, and I've always supported the principle that once, that is deci- that once that's decided, then you, um, then you work together and you vote together. So that might sound a bit kind of processy and tortuous, but actually what it is is it's a way of, again, um, bringing together differing views, testing those views, arguing the merits, synthesising a final position and then going out and supporting that final position. So I think it's actually really a useful process, a really good one. Uh, the Liberals actually do the same thing, but they don't really say that they do the same thing. In theory, they can cross the floor and vote differently to each other, but that that doesn't happen in, in practice. So um, they kind of talk about being different to us, but they're not, they're not really, they actually just do the same thing um, because it mm-hmm. would be a massive deal for one of them to come and vote with Labor. Um, and we saw that, you know, with the Banking Royal Commission, George Christensen, who's a National Party MP from Mackay in Queensland, repeatedly said he was going to cross the floor to vote for a Banking Royal Commission and just did not do that. And um, ultimately we were able to, bring the Liberals, the entire Liberal Party party room to supporting a Banking Royal Commission. So um, yeah. that was how that was. But have I ever disagreed with a position publicly taken by the Labor Party? actually can't think of a time in the Parliament where I've voted in a way that I wasn't happy with. Um, because actually once you work these things through and you come back to well, what are our values, what do we stand for, what do people send us to Canberra for, you, de- you generally do get to the right to the right decision. And some things are judgment calls, of course. Like Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, one of the things about being in opposition is we don't get to choose what's in the bill, right? So if the government comes up with a bill and we like 60% of it and we hate 40% of it, well, what do we do? Do we vote against the whole thing because we hate 40% and, you know, 60% we do like also um, it's thrown out the baby with the bathwater style or do we vote for it even though 40% of it is terrible and have people say, well, how could you vote for this terrible thing? What's wrong with the Labor Party? Why would you vote for this? It's terrible. And, you know, we get that quite often because the government does it deliberately. They deliberately put things into legislation um, that um, they know that we don't support. And so there's often this process of you try to amend it, do you try to split it apart, do you try to convince the government to split it apart, Um, you know, how do you actually how do you resolve that? And then at the end of the day, though, if you can't get a negotiated way of dealing with that, then ultimately it just comes to a binary proposition. Is it a yes or is it a no? Yeah. And that's, as I say, that could be a judgment call. Mm-hmm. So have I voted mm-hmm. for bills that have got bits in them that I don't like? Yes, but on the basis that the other bits in the bill that were important that we did support uh, needed to be done. Yeah, I think that's a good point as well. Um, and so a, a bill is, you know, there's a whole different bunch of things, you know, like you might not like this little bit here, but you like this bit here. And I suppose the reason why I asked the question was because, you know, you started, you started, you were in the Labor Party 
from 21, did you say before? Yeah, I know. It sounds ridiculous when you say it out loud. Well, I suppose it's not, I don't think it's ridiculous. I think it's um, really impressive because to know at 21 and then to not have changed now and you're 42 now, that I think yeah. that's phenomenal because me at 21, looking back now, when I started podcasting, I was 23. If I go back and listen to some of the things that I thought and said, I'll be like, how the how did I think that, you know, well, I know how I thought of that because I just didn't know much about the world and all that sort of stuff. I just find it really interesting that you have, it's just like you've really known from a young age that like, this is who I am and this is what I stand for. And I find that so fascinating because I've struggled with that a lot. And I know so many people out there struggle with things like, you know, identity, you know? Yeah, no, for sure. But don't you think, it's a bit different, right? Because when I, uh, my first election uh, that I voted in, my first federal election was 1996, right? Mm-hmm. And so um, I wasn't in the Labor Party then. Uh, I was sort of involved in some campus staff. I was like the editor of my uni newspaper and stuff like that. But um, I didn't get super political until after John Howard became the Prime Minister and started you know, he put up uni fees and he um, started cutting funding to childcare centres and he started trying to implement this radical, radical workplace agenda to try to make it harder to get a well-paying job or a secure job, which he's ultimately successful in doing. So there's a bit of a thing about, well, if you go through this massive social change, yeah, then it does kind of, you know, gives rise to this, um, uh, to this very clear... I very clearly had the view that actually what we should do is fund education, fund healthcare, fund early learning and, you know, not try to make things terrible at work for people. And that was because I was going through a time where the opposite was happening. And so Mm. in some ways, anyone who's turned 21 after about 2006, which is when work choices was brought in, um, has, uh, there hasn't been as, as much to kind of galvanise your politics That's a good in, point. in a sense. You know, we, I mean, we had, we had our government, 07 to 13, that did some incredible things, um, but sometimes positive things aren't, aren't as galvanising for your politics as negative things, right? And so mm-hmm, mm-hmm. this current government's been around since 2013 and they've done some bad things, Um but they haven't had as much power. They were in minority government for a period. Um, the Senate's been more difficult for them um, than it probably was, um, well, than it certainly was in 2006 when they had the numbers. So uh, some of the harshest edges of politics have been ameliorated for people because of those circumstances mm-hmm. um, of the government having a bit less power. But ultimately, you know, it's when you see the terrible things happen, like, you know, for example, the attempts to weaken the environment laws, the uh, increases to university fees that went through the House last fortnight. Now there's question of whether they're going to start withdrawing support from unemployment benefits and wage subsidies. I reckon we're going to start to see people really getting galvanised in their politics pretty soon in the same way I was in the mid-90s because I think that yeah. things are about to get pretty real for people. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, just everyone down here, it's like it's every time you go on Facebook, everyone has a political view now. Um you know, it's just, yeah, everyone's for or against and it's just like, it's, it's getting crazy. So I think, and I think to, to some degree, that's probably why I've become more interested in, in it as well, because uh, it's in my face more and, um, you know, I'm a little bit older and, you know, not necessarily smarter, but yeah, I think that's, it's like when you start to see things actually that could really affect you, it's like, oh, wow. I mean, I, it's impossible not to take a stance. Yeah, and that's the point. That's the point I'm making. When things do start to get real in your life, mm. this is how I got into politics, this is how I think a lot of people will, it's just impossible yeah. because the when it is possible, that's a, that's a form of privilege that is now being eroded. Yeah, well, that's a good point. Um, cool. Terry, this has been, we've gone 20 minutes over time here. I thank you for that <laughs> because uh, we could have, I've had a second coffee and I was like, well, we could just go for another 10 hours, but I'll have to get you on again for, for round two. I think that'd be awesome. Thanks, Tom. It was great to talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. Really um, good fun.
Thanks for inviting me on. I have to say, um, I was a bit interested in what I could add to your, to your podcast, given what you usually talk about. So thank you for having me. It's really nice. <laughs> I know. I'd be interested to see if like, well, literally the last episode before was like some guy who um, was not some guy, so it was a friend. He had incredible experiences on all these psychedelic drugs. And now he's, he used to be an addict, but he's not an addict anymore. And then and now we're getting a uh, politician, Terry Butler on the show. And uh, <laughs> but it's good. I think it's, I think people want to see, you know, that, you know, people think of politicians as like this behind closed door things and they're all like chortling away and they've got their high tees and all this, but, you know, obviously <laughs> just people, we're all just people, you know? Oh yeah. And part of, you know, one of the reasons I was happy to come on is because I just want, uh, what I want out of politics is I want to make as many people as possible realize that it is possible to be in politics, no matter who mm. you are. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Is. I think that's why I wanted you on the show because I really got that vibe from you um, from, from Q and A. So thank you. That was awesome. Oh, well, thank you so much. Really good to talk. Cool guys. Thank you so much. Speak to you next week. Bye.